It is 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock. It's time to, uh, the Wayne County Board of Commissioners to conduct business of the County of Wayne. Uh, I would like to inform everyone, please silence your cell phones. Uh, invocation this morning is by Commissioner Barbara Acock, and the pledge is also by Commissioner Barbara Acock. Commissioner Acock. Oh. Can we stand and say the pledge, please? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Can we bow our head, please? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather today. As we begin our meeting, we declare that I, your purpose will prevail. Give us wisdom to walk the path you have set before us. I would like to thank you for holding our prayers for the Mayo family who is attending today. Help us to be unified according to your word as we work together. We start with you and we end with you. Amen. Amen. Can we stand please say in I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do, do I have a motion we approve the minutes of the November 2nd Board of Commissioners meeting? So moved. I have a motion on the floor. Any discussion? If none, I'll show sign of right hand. Uh, Mr. Honeycutt, any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, first, uh, under unfinished business, uh, Commissioner Foster has asked that we uh, put discussion of afternoon meetings, and that would be number two. And then, as we discussed in our uh, pre-agenda meeting, uh, under budget amendments, uh, we would like to walk on number 159, uh, which we discussed. And then uh, we would also, under consent agenda, add number nine, uh, reimbursement resolution uh, for Wayne Community College and their advanced manufacturing center. And that is all I have, Mr. Chair. And I do ask that be added with appropriate budget. With, with appropriate budget. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, special presentations? Yeah. So moved. I have a motion on the floor that we agend, uh, adjust the agenda. Uh, any other discussion? If none, all in favor show sign the right hand. Special presentation, Mr. Honeycutt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, it's motion to approve Farm City Week proclamation, and I believe Kevin Johnson is here. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, it's that time of year, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas. It's a time we celebrate uh, a lot of things in our lives, but. Uh, of course, Farm City Week is a time we like to celebrate agriculture and uh, its contributions. So uh, I do have a proclamation I want to read to you. Uh, before I do that, I, I want to remind you that the Farm City Week banquet is Monday night, 6 o'clock at the Maxwell Center. So you definitely are invited. Uh, whereas the growth and development of the county and the well-being of all citizens are dependent upon cooperation and exchange between the two essential environments of our society farm and non-farm families and whereas studies show agriculture and agribusiness together bring in one billion of income to our county which represents 21 percent of the county's income and 20 percent of our county's employment and whereas Wayne County's farm income makes a significant contribution to the economy of our county with over 450 million in gross farm gate sales during last year. Whereas Wayne County is home to Mount Olive Pickle, largest pickle company in the United States, 
and home to Goldsboro Mill and Company, parent company of Butterball Turkey, the largest producer of turkey products in the United States. Whereas Wayne County was recognized by Farm Futures Magazine as the fifth best place to farm in the United States. Whereas whether we live on the farm or in the city, we share common needs, food for our nourishment, forestry products for our shelter and paper, and fiber for clothing and materials. And whereas if Wayne County is to continue to prosper, it is important that farm and non-farm residents appreciate and understand each other. And whereas Farm City Week provides an unparalleled experience for farm and city people to become better acquainted. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Wayne County Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim November 19th through 25th, 2021 to be Farm City Week and a week of thankfulness. Adopted the 16th day of November, 2021. Do I? Have a motion, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I, I, I have. It gets Barbara. Done. Okay, Commissioner Acott had um, any discussion. I would like to say something, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to thank our farming community. Uh, as living on a working farm for years, my husband farmed. I seen the rewards and I seen the struggles that our farmers have. It's a tough life, but it's a good life. Both of my children were raised on the farm, and um, I think from that, they have become good citizens for our community because they understand the hard work that it takes to make a farm operational and, and make money from farming because that's one of the tough things sometimes yeah. because uh, farmers are the biggest gamblers in the world, and they have to rely on the weather to make things. Uh, my husband and I, we had some good years and then we had some bad years. But you know, we always, uh, we live on a Century 100 farm and I'm very proud of that. And I hope it stays another 100 years in our family. And I want to personally thank the farmers and the people who are in agriculture because it's, it's something we need to, for our community. So thank you, Kevin, Absolutely. for breathing this today. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? No one else. Uh, I have a motion on the floor. All in favor, show sign of right hand. Motion carries, Madam Clerk. Thank you very much. Look forward. Hopefully, I'll see y'all Monday night. Thank All you, right. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is food involved? Yes, sir. We'll be there. <laughs> we'll be there. <laughs> um, next, Mr. Chair, under special presentations, number two, motion to approve the 2021 National Apprenticeship Week proclamation and uh, we do have Craig folk here as well and he's got some additional information also yes uh, absolutely uh, chairman Acock thank you and uh, commissioners um, I did want to start off just saying that uh, apprenticeships I believe are uh, they've been around for a long time but there's something a little more transformative that we've done with it and uh, we've got 60 apprentices currently right now that didn't have to choose between going to work and going to school. And for some people that are trying to get income mobility and for some people that have to choose between one or the other, it's providing change for people's lives. It's a positive impact. Um, but I also wanted to invite uh, Ms. Christy Saul. She is the work-based learning and apprenticeship coordinator. This may have been an initiative I started at the college, but I couldn't have done it by myself. And if you guys don't mind, I get enough time in front of the mic. I'd like for her to read the proclamation since every Every day she lives this, deals with our employers, deals with our apprentices. Good morning. Good morning. Whereas National Apprenticeship Week is celebrating its seventh anniversary of raising awareness of the vital role apprenticeships provide in creating qualified and highly, a highly skilled workforce in diverse industries in Wayne County, North Carolina, and across the nation. And whereas the advancement and well-being of the United States of America depends upon the continued development of skilled workers in their chosen fields, and whereas an ever-growing number of job creators and career seekers are discovering the benefits of apprenticeships unique learn-while-you-earn model, and whereas North Wayne County, North Carolina, 
recognizes that robust apprenticeship programs provide tangible value to both job creators and, apprentice, and apprentices with the potential to increase productivity, improve diversity and inclusion, and reduce recru recruitment and training costs while providing a pathway to prosperous careers for job seekers. Now, therefore, the Wayne County Board of Commissioners does hereby declare November 15th, 2021 through <coughs> November 21st, 2021 as National Apprenticeship Week here in Wayne County, North Carolina. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the uh, proclamation. I have a motion on the floor that we approve the proclamation. Uh, any discussion? I would like to say something too on this. I thank you, uh, Mr. Falk and Christy, for uh, this. I got a grandson that's in this program. He was at Wayne Community College. He knew he needed an education, but he just did not know which way he wanted to go, and this program became available, and he is absolutely loving it. It is opening doors for him. Um, I just see the skilled labor force as our future because we need skilled labor. And I want to thank Wayne Community College for offering this program because I think it's gonna make a big difference in a lot of lives for our community. And uh, so thank you again from my heart for doing this. Anyone else? And again, thank y'all. Uh, I've had children, step children to take courses at the college and uh, uh, I, I feel like there are better, peop better people today because of some of the training they got at the college. Anyone else? <clears throat> if not, all in favor show sure sign the right hand. Motion carries. Now, um, I, I was asked also to, uh, to, to make an announcement for you all, uh, to you all and, and to the public. Um, uh, in speaking with the county manager, Mr. Honeycutt, and, uh, and, and the family of uh, Mr. Ray Mayo, Commissioner, the late Commissioner Ray Mayo, um, the, uh, the, the opportunity at, at hand uh, here in our community is to recognize somebody who was really um, at the forefront of apprenticeships. When I started this, the very first person I went to was, was Ray Mayo. And the reason why is because I knew he had a long-standing apprenticeship program that had started back in 1982, and that that is how he produced his skilled workforce. So uh, we looked at a way that we could honor Mr. Mayo as we did this the first time that we had recognized uh, this is National Apprenticeship Week in Wayne County. And so we reached out to the family. We asked, you know, should this be something that's an award? Should we do some sort of a scholarship? What would you guys like? And ultimately, what we've worked out is a scholarship um, honoring Ray Mayo. So at this time right now, I'd like to recognize uh, the family of Ray Mayo, um, his, uh, his wife, uh, Janice Mayo, uh, son, Steve Mayo, who runs uh, NC Manufacturing, and his wife, Tracy Mayo, and then also Miss Karen Hardesty, the daughter of Ray Mayo. This family, they not only give back to this community, they give back to others throughout the world. She's currently in Africa right now on a dental missions trip. But we want to recognize them and what will be established through a partnership between Wayne Community College and, and Wayne, uh, Wayne County, and the, uh, we've got over here the, uh, uh, foundation director Adrian Northington and the foundation of the uh, college and um, the interim president Miss Patty Pfeiffer we're going to be establishing a scholarship for Wayne County resident uh, every year to be able to get a scholarship to go into an apprenticeship program which will also mean that they'll be able to uh, maybe get some of those other things that uh, that they need while they're going to school um, whether it be tuition books uh, fees um, some technology and uh, and so we'd like to thank this partnership and recognize uh, Ray Mayo and his family for the impact that they've made inside this community Pfeiffer, Mayo Family uh, Foundation, have y'all got any comments you'd like to make? We just want to say that, you know, we have appreciated the support of the commissioners all the time, but, you know, these kind of events, that, you know, to memorialize somebody that was very special, not only to the county and the county commissioners, but also to the college and our community for our um, career and technical programs, um, especially machinists. We greatly appreciate this opportunity to the commissioners and more importantly to the Thank you. Thank you. Y'all good? Mm -hmm. Come up, come up to the podium, please, oh. Steve. Please.
On, on behalf of the, the Mayo family, we want to thank you for this uh, recognition. Um, my father, he was a strong advocate for apprenticeships. Um, and, and as my father, I am an apprenticeship graduate myself. I, I went, I was served my apprenticeship under him in the machinist trade. And uh, it is something that uh, he was passionate about. Uh, our family is passionate about. And this recognition means so much to us. And uh, we thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like to follow up, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I'm also on the Board of Trustees at the college. Uh, had the pleasure, I guess, probably one of the first commissioners that's ever served on that board. Uh, and it's an important position. But one of the first things I learned when I went on the board at the college was the, uh, what Ray Mayo put into the apprentice program at Wayne Community College. He was a, a behind the scene person. He wasn't looking at any recognition, uh, but I was, it, it kindly uh, pushed you thinking when you're sitting in a meeting with, uh, and conducting the business at the college and his name would, uh, would keep coming up. When, when any time that the apprentice uh, programs were discussed, his name, his name always comes to the surface, and I, and I, and I kind of thought, you know, Ray's got more involvement in the college than I have. I'm on the board, but he's, he, he's, he, he helped make things happen, and no, no one else knew it except to some of the people at the college, and everyone at the college didn't know it, but, uh, and, but he did, and I'm. This is great. This is. He would, he would be honored. He wouldn't want you to do it, but he would be honored. <laughs> and thank you all again. Mr. Chair, if I could shout, I, I do a special thanks to Craig and Dr. Pfeiffer and the community college and family. Um, when the resolution came up, um, you know, we asked Craig to read it. We, we started talking about Ray and, and what was the best way to honor him. And, and uh, again, a lot of the, the details we were still working on, but uh, we did want to go ahead and make the announcement and, and really honor Ray in his memory and what he meant to uh, not only the apprenticeship program, but what he meant to Wayne County as well. So we want to thank you for that. Anyone else? I have a motion on the floor. Well, we're voted. Yeah, we <laughs> She tries to keep me straight, but she we'll has a handful yeah. sometimes. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Gurley, appointment committee. Yes, sir. Uh, appointment committee met this morning. We submit the following. The reappointment of Kendall Lee to the town of Mount Olive Planning Board, Board of Adjustments, and that's in form of a motion. I have a motion from the former committee to reappoint uh, Kendall Lee to the Mount Olive Planning Board and Board of Adjustments. So moved. I have a motion. All in favor, show sign of right hand. Uh, also, uh, we would, uh, would like to appoint uh, Nadia Lopez as the alternate to the town of Mount Olive Planning Board and Board of Adjustments, and that's in form of a motion, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion on the floor. Any discussion? If none, I'll show sign of right with right hand. And the last one we have is the reappointment of Tammy Cannon to the Wayne County Tourism Development Authority, and that's in form of a motion as well. I'll have a motion on the floor. Any discussion? If none, I'll show sign of right hand. That's all we have. Thank you, Mr. Gurley. Yes, sir. Um, Unfinished business. Yes, sir. Uh, first is clarification on Board of Commissioners rescinding mask mandate. Um, at our last meeting, the board basically did a blanket rescension of the mask mandate. And I sent out an email to department heads and saying that the uh, mask mandate was removed except for DSS and health um, because they were health care providers. Um, 
I think there was questions also about the Register of Deeds and, and the Sheriff's Department. Uh, so in talking with Commissioner Foster, we wanted just to clarify what the intent and purpose was of the Board of Commissioners to make sure that um, the implementation is what you want. Yes, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, you, even in your statement still, um, I want to correct your statement. You said that you sent out an email stating that we said that we took away the mask mandate to everyone except the health department, correct? Yes, Is sir. that what you just said? Yes, sir. But that wasn't what we voted on. That, that, yes, sir. That, I just want to make sure that's right. clear because you're saying one thing, but we voted on something different. And I want to make sure that the public and everyone knows what's clear, what right. we actually voted on. Right. Okay. So, and, and we have done some, some research, um, uh, and I appreciate Dr. Weiss and, and Dr. Stackhouse being here today. Um, um, there, there's still, you know, from, from our understanding, uh, requirements for mask mandates uh, at health, we, a health provider. So we would like to add that as a still being a, a mandated place. Uh, the reason why we added DSS as well is because DSS is on uh, different floors from the health department at the COB. Uh, you'll have health on first floor, DSS second, health on third, DSS on four, so they're all intermingled. So that's the reason why uh, the recommendation is to include uh, DSS as part of that um, mandate or still requiring them to wear a mask. Uh, the other issue is with respect to the Sheriff's Department and Registered Deeds is that uh, as elected officials, they get to make uh, those decisions based on their facilities themselves. Dr. Stockhouse need to. If, if, if there's any any questions about, uh, yeah, um, uh, you know that that it is mandated um, uh, for health providers. Um, I read a little something different as far as the health providers go, um, from the email that you sent out. Uh, It said, it's stating that fully vaccinated should wear source control when they're in areas of healthcare facilities and encounters patients, hospital, cafeteria, and other hallways, or, or, or et cetera. You're saying that it's required here, but it's saying in, in what I read through the, what was sent out to me, was sent to all of us stating that it should. I personally don't have a problem with wearing masks. I don't, I prefer that masks be worn throughout all facilities. And my issue that I'm having with this is that we're trying to separate the health department from all other county offices, which is kind of sort of dangerous at this point that this is cold and flu season. If you look at the numbers, your numbers are rising. Why? Because temperatures are dropping. People are congregating inside. Also up north, numbers are, numbers are rising because of the same exact thing. We know during cold and flu season, we know what that is. People get sicker. That's just bottom line. So that's the reason why I have a problem with this. If someone goes to the health department and has COVID, they can leave there and go to any other department. They have to have a mask on and never can leave and go anywhere else around the county without a mask. Hopefully they wouldn't, but they could. You mean to tell me that an employee could be sitting inside of an office with COVID, spreading it to everyone in that office and then leave there and go to the health department, get tested, but have to wear a mask when they get to the health department, get tested, could be positive in the end, but they've already been in the office with other people. This is dangerous. We're putting people's lives at danger, whatever. If, if, if our director and our Dr. Taylor professionals, this is what they do. If they think masks should be worn inside of there, I feel like masks should be worn everywhere else for safety. We, um, as Commissioner Gurley stated, that the schools took away masks. He was kind of sort of following what they did. We just found out recently that the schools had an outbreak, correct? So now, one week after the masks are gone, you're having an outbreak. It's, 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 it's right in front of our face. We made a bad decision. Without looking at the numbers, without looking at research, without looking at anything. Now, the CDC is stating that, like I said, it should be in the health departments. That's just everywhere, because sick people are everywhere. 
Sick people just don't only go to the health department hospitals. Every, they're everywhere. They're at work during the day. They're at the malls. They're at Lowe's. They're everywhere. And, 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 and we rushed to do something that made no sense at all. Now, this is the problem that I have. I don't have a problem with masks being worn at the health department, but I think they should be worn everywhere else. And that's the point that I'm trying to make here. And I think that's something that this board needs to reconsider. Uh, Dr. Stackhouse, have you got a presentation that you want to present to us? I was actually here to the wearing of masks at the health department in the facility that we're in. Uh, I really don't want to comment further than that. I think it becomes a decision that's very political in the public and other areas. But there's no question that CDC's recommendation at this point applying to our building is that we are in an area of high, uh, high visibility, high, high percentage of people. If you go to the next slide, please. We're in an area with high community transmission under the CDC's recommendation. In the past 14 days, we've had 224 cases, which comes to a positive rate of about 180 per 100,000 people, which is three times the level that the CDC recommends uh, community transmission as an issue. Uh, percent positivity is good at 3.2 percent. But even at 3.2 percent, yeah, there are 4,000 people out there who probably have COVID right now. How severe that COVID is, how much you as a governing body want to protect the public versus the other interest of the public in terms of commerce, et cetera, that's a political decision, not a health department decision. Anyone else have any comments or questions for Dr. Stackhouse? Hate to put you on the spot, but thank you. We Appreciate rely you. on your your input. All right. Anyone else? Um, yes. I want to know if Dr. Weiss um, had uh, any concerns that she would like to comment on. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I so I will say that I concur with Dr. Stackhouse. Um, you know, we get our significant amount of funding from the federal government and the state. And this came, this slide came directly from the CDC website. So we didn't like make it up, it's exactly verbatim. And that's the reference in the bottom. And for us at the local health department level, we participate with the state in weekly meetings all the time about this thorny topic. When do we stop putting the pedal to the metal. When do we stop testing? When do we stop vaccinating? When is that going to happen? And in their view, it's not time yet. And so we're hearing that at our state and federal level. And it's hard to balance that off with a 3% positivity rate, which is excellent, way lower than the state. I think for us, the other driving factor is every other medical facility in this area is masking. I went to the optometrist yesterday. Everyone had a mask on. We are directly and intimately in contact with patients, sick or not. It is very close contact. We do midwifery. We do, you know, blood draws. We're very close to people physically. There's no glass or plastic barrier between us. And I think that is what medical facilities are sort of struggling with. The intimate contact that we have with clients can't be removed from our delivery of services. And I think that's what's driving the state and the federal government to hold us still in a position where they want us to mask up at our facilities. Listen, I'm praying that this lifts as quickly as you are. But we are, in the eyes of the state and the federal government, a health care facility, and the expectation is that we will follow that. Now, of course, you have the jurisdiction over this county, and all decisions are made at the local level. So we will honor whatever you decide to do. But I share the same position as Dr. Stackhouse on this particular topic. Um, Dr. Weiss, Thank you. Um, while you're there, um, while you were saying that, you know, I understand it's the safety and you don't have the barriers and everything, but... And, and I agree, you should have masks in, in, in the facility. My, my question is, there are other places that don't have those barriers as well. Those other places, places around the county that deal with, can deal with possibly the same people that bring you coming into your office daily. Do you think that they should have masks in your professional opinion also? Should it be masks throughout any public building that the city 
proposed. So can you go to the previous slide? Carol. So these are the other kinds of places that the CDC recommends fall in the same category with health care. And they are things like uh, homeless shelters, nursing homes. This is the list that CDC came forward with that feels that they're on par with us in terms of intimate contact with clients. Being a health official, where my, you know, where my chain of command for my profession is the state and the federal government, I think this is a good list. Okay, and and, and that's I, would, I saw the list, and I'm seeing the schools and everything else also in there. But schools I'm, is optional on the toolkit. I think that toolkit was an effort by the state to well, if create I'm some guidelines. This, it says masks will still be required in child care schools and camps. So I'm just reading what it says right now. I here. know, and so, I think what happened is the state kind of weighed in with the toolkit and made it a recommendation but not a requirement and that's up to the school department okay well i'm, I'm, just, I'm just reading what you're saying yeah. but, but i mean i know still we, we might even have something you know different or whatever but it's saying north carolina dhs hs um this is their requirements um this is not from the cdc this right here this is saying from the north carolina dhs hs so i'm asking a professional opinion right now you are a health director Professionally, someone comes into your office with COVID to get any of those services, might not know they have it yet, get tested, they have it, blunt, fine, with a mask, because they have to wear a mask in your office. But then before they got to your office, they went to tax office, pay their taxes, went to the registered deeds office to get a, a birth certificate. Might have went to the election office to change their election registration. They're coughing or they're sick, they're spreading germs throughout these places. But then they come to you and get tested because they're finally feeling really, really bad. Like, oh, maybe I should go get a test. They test negative or whatever. <clears throat> but at least in your office, they had a mask on. They went to all these other places without one, with those same contagious germs. Do you think, in your professional opinion, because you're having a, you want a mask required at your facility, in your office, that mass should be required in other offices and facilities around the county. I think that the mask requirement in my office is appropriate, and I feel like that's the extent of my purview and understanding about intimate contact. Um, I can't speak to facilities and what they do all day, or I can't speak to, I'm not there, I don't understand all of those networking, and whether it's indoors or outdoors, how close the desks are. There's a lot of parameters that go into this decision making. This is a thorny topic. I, this I mean, is not I, a straightforward, one size fits all kind of a okay, thing. But do, okay, well, let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you a straightforward question. I hear you. Because you, 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 I, I, the dodging is fine, but it is what it is. Do masks help? They do help slow the transmission of the virus, yes. Okay. If worn properly and both people have one on, yes. Okay. Thank That's you. a scientific fact. Thank you. I want to thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. I know that um, through the pandemic, when we were at our highest rates, your, op your offices, your departments work really hard, really hard. I saw the lines of people getting vaccinated, getting tested, and I don't want to see that happen again. I don't want to see the departments worn out, tired, not knowing how we're going to uh, immunize, 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 immunize people, excuse me. I don't, I don't want to see that happen again. So I'm hoping that people are more careful, regardless if this board decides that we're going to put mandate on masks again. Um, I know it was a lot of wear and tear on your staff. Um, so that's my hope, and thank you so much. I, I want to say one statement that we got audited recently on all of our COVID activities, soup to nuts, everything we've done. And the one thing that stood out by the state was the level of collaboration across this county. They were shocked and impressed at the county manager's level, at EMS, at facilities, OES, IT. Everybody came together to support all of us in this effort and we have had a really county presence in leading both testing and vaccination and i'm very proud of that because in a lot of counties they just don't have that so we should all applaud ourselves for our level of collaboration coming right down from 
this group and from our leadership at the county manager level. So I just wanted to share that. I, I We've got, got very high marks for collaboration. Thank you. I got one question, Mr. Chairman. Nick. For Jim. And if I may put in a plug, we're immunizing people, first doses, second doses, children, and boosters right now at the food line, uh, the food line in Little River Plaza. If you are an individual concerned about approach, being approached by people who don't have masks and the chance that they have COVID, the way to significantly reduce your chance of dying from this disease is to keep your vaccines up to date, get your vaccines, bring your children, get your vaccines. And we are open for walk-ins. You can make an appointment. We need bodies there. We've got the vaccine. We need to put it out. Can you explain the individuals who, who are able to get the booster shot at this point? <clears throat> at this point, individuals who can get the boosters are anybody who is immunocompromised and had their second dose two months ago or more. The third shot is for anybody who got their Janssen single dose, their two Pfizer, or their two Moderna more than six months ago. And first doses are available for children and adults for Pfizer and, and uh, Moderna now. Uh, excuse me, Pfizer for children now. The Pfizer is available at this point for anybody from age five up. The Moderna is still sitting at 18 up. The booster, while it, the, the first people they really recommend is anybody over 65, their criteria for giving a booster is so small that if you think you're at increased risk, you are eligible for that booster down to age 18. And that also gives priority to people who may work in food service, this is, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you think you're exposed to people more than the average person, come get your booster. It is one of the safest vaccines ever produced. And we've given out now close to 55,000 doses of one type or another. And uh, knock on wood, we're, we're, we're seeing some local reactions, but nothing severe. And I'll tell you in my next slide, if you would, that we're still... Uh, back one, I'm sorry, the, the, the graph. Those are the deaths from Wayne, in Wayne County from COVID. We saw the, the, the Delta variant. We, the, the last number is not a total for October. It's through the middle of October. So it's still out there. You should be concerned. Come get your shots. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And I'm glad you hit that point when it comes to deaths because a lot of times people don't realize how serious it is. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Gurley. I got one question, Dr. Stackhouse. Is that, um, go back to the first slide, um, mm -hmm. Carol, please. Has there been an update? I didn't read the, the part. Has there been an update from May 14th? Is that is that the same in the October 25th uh, update? Yeah, or the slides upside down. The May, the May CDC up to, uh, requirement came out. NCDHHS's response to that requirement is what you see there. Uh, in September 10th, there was another publication from the CDC, and that's the simplified version of what CDC put out on September 10th on October 25th. Okay. There's not been anything since that time. As far as we can tell, the governor's mandate for masking is still in effect. It's a Executive Order 215, but I think it's lost in the shuffle. I don't know if it's even been reconsidered, but I can't find it. Nor could Andrew Neal the other day. So. Oh, thanks, sir. Any questions? Mr. Thank Chair? You. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we, um, we we reenact the mask mandate until flu, cold and flu season is over. I have a motion on the floor in discussion. No discussion. Can I act on this, Mr. Parker? Yes, sir. Okay. All are in favor of total mass mandate for Wayne County? Show sign of right hand. Not for
for the departments in Wayne County, for all of the Wayne County departments. Have you got that clear, Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. He is making a motion to reenact the mask mandate for all departments in Wayne County until cold and flu season is over. Um, I will say something real quick. Can we go back to that first slide with the CDC in there? As we looked at the cases, um, we're definitely over that 50 new positive cases, over 100,000 residents for a seven day period. Um, and, you know, I was told that it was the CDC um, special requirement for health departments, but that's not true as far as anything that I've seen so far. Um, it's just a requirement across the board. Um, I think we jumped the gun. It's okay. Sometimes we jump the gun. We made a mistake. We, we have a chance right now to correct that mistake. You know, we have a chance to um, hopefully save someone from COVID. You know, um, our health director said if two people have on masks, then it is a, it does help. That's our professional that we hired here at the county to run our health department. She's all sm she's smarter than all of us when it comes to all of when it comes to this. Um, some have stated that they talked to experts and this, that, and the third, and we're going off of what another board did, and that's fine, all dandy. But that's our health director stating that. Um, we can also see the recommendations from the CDC, the recommendations from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, a whole lot of people that have a whole lot of degrees and do a whole lot of research and things that we don't do here. Uh, once again, you know, our schools took away mandate, took away the mask. A week later, it's a COVID outbreak in one of the schools. Uh, you know, so, that's all I have to say. Mr. Chairman, I got one more thing. Mr. Gurley. Uh, one more question, Dr. Stackhouse, Dr. Wise. Uh, on this 50 new positive cases per 100,000 residents, and you know what I'm fixing to ask, is this, uh, do the, as I was told, slightly positive or false positive play into this 50 These count? are the combination of the reported, no, not everything is reported, but those people who report to us and to the state, it's a combination of positive PCR tests and positive antigen tests. It's about 50-50 in the numbers. The antigen tests are 80% true positives. So if you wanted to cut that number down, it'd be hard to do it much more than about 10% for false positives. Okay. That's what you're asking. So, so the, the, the rapid test, is it is it in, in this number? Yes. It is in this number? Yes, and that's the one. So in my case, in one of my daughter's cases, when I went and got the rapid test and went two, three hours later and got the PCR, and the same day, and she come back, she was slightly positive on the, the rapid test. And when I got the PCR test, which was a couple of days later, but went three hours later to get it, she was negative. And so she would be counted as positive, correct? Uh, yes. In these numbers. Yes. But she wasn't but, but, positive. But again, that happens less than 20% of the time in the tests. So if half of those tests were PCR and so half 20 of them were antigen, of 20 you could cut of that number down about 10. 20. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that so then we're below the, the percentage. No, it would still be 160 per, per 100,000. In other words, of that 180 per 100,000, half were PCR, half were probably rapid tests. Okay. All right. If you if you had 25% false positive rate in the in the rapid test, you'd only be cutting out what 15, 16 to 20 of those tests as being false positive. So your true positive rate is still going to be over 140 per 100,000 or 160. Excuse me, from 182 to 160. And that's a reported test. So you've already got a built-in error of people who may be testing and not reporting. A lot of people can do home tests now and 
don't come in. Okay. Anyone else? Hey, Mr. Chairman, before we, we make a decision, um, one, of, one of my favorite sayings is, too much is given, much is required. And, you know, this board is, you know, we're in a position where we can save lives without even uh, being physically involved. This vote could save lives. So I'm just hoping that people keep that in account. Thank you, sir. Okay. I got one more, one more question. So just to make sure I understand, is this recommendation for people that are not vaccinated at all or everybody? It's everyone. Everyone. Yes, sir. So, so the ones that are not vaccinated are putting people in more danger than the people that are vaccinated? Correct. Ma'am? Correct. I didn't hear what you said. Did you correct. say correct? Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Right. That'll work. Okay. But I would like to just add, since he said that statement, but people that are vaccinated are still able to carry the virus and be test positive, correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Any other discussion? No, sir. I have a... Chairman Matt, Commissioner Wick, did you mean just county employees or everybody that comes in a county building? Anyone that comes in a county building, as well as the county employees. Thank you, sir, for clarifying that. Anything else before we vote? State what we're voting on, yeah. Mm -hmm. State what we're voting on. Motion to reenact the mask mandate for all departments, all employees, and visitors until cold and flu season is over. Thank you. You got that? Mm -hmm. All right, I have a motion on the floor. All in favor of the motion, show sign of right hand. All opposed? I don't know how Ms. Acock voted. Opposed? Okay. Motion failed four to three. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I would ask that this, uh, this matter be placed on the table uh, for a period of three months. Is that in the form of a motion? That's in the form of a motion. I have... Will you repeat that motion, please? Yes, my motion is that this matter be laid on the table uh, not to be reconsidered for three months. I have a motion on the floor in discussion. Mr. Chairman, I, before we, we do, I just want to clarify to make sure that what we are doing now with respect to uh, following your direction is that uh, bath mandates are not required for the public or, or employees right now. The Register of Deeds and the Sheriff's Department as elected officials within their facilities, they have that choice to make themselves. Correct. And um, also at the COB and also at our vaccine center, uh, masks will be required. Is that's not what that's not what we said. Oh, well, that's, I, not what that's, what that's, that's not, not what was voted on. That's not what was voted on. And there's no way, there's nowhere stating that within the CDC that those places should be wearing masks specifically. So I asked for that, didn't never got it. Still not to this day, I haven't got it. Mr. So, Chairman, uh, Mr. we Chairman, stated one thing, he just asked for it to be tabled, we need to vote on that. Mr. Chairman, I will move my motion. And instead, I would like to make a motion to clarify <laughs> our policy. And, and that motion is that uh, the roof, the mask mandate uh, would be clarified to include a mask requirement at the health DSS building known as the county office building for all employees and visitors and that we allow the sheriff and the register of deeds to we, we, we can't we, we can't allow them. They've already got that authority. And, you, and that we you need to add the, the um, food, line. food line building too. As well as the food line building where vaccinations are taking place would require masks. And that the sheriff and the register of deeds has the authority to require masks in their facilities. Is that clarified? Yes, sir. 
Does that clarify, Mr. Parker? Mr. Neal. Okay. Have you got that, Madam Clerk? Yes, sir. What I have is that Commissioner Joe Daughtery rescinded his motion uh, to table the matter, and he made a motion to clarify the mask mandate that had previously been rescinded to exclude the county office building, also known as the health department, for all employees and visitors, as well as the food line building. And the sheriff's office and register of deeds office have their own authorities to require masks in their facilities. Do, do we need to clarify the food line as the vaccine site? I will add that, sir. I mean, that just so we don't think we can't go in food line. <laughs> okay. Good point. Up the food line in Marmac. Right. <laughs> Good. Okay, yeah, I have a motion on the floor. Any discussion? If none, all in favor show sign the right hand. All opposed? You got that? Thing vote is before 4 3. That's five what two. I'm. 5 2. Four, three, five, two. 5 2. 5 2. Right, move on, Mr. Tonka. Um, then next under unfinished business is a uh, discussion of afternoon meetings and that's uh, Commissioner Foster wanted to bring that. I'm just going to state this real quick. Um, during our discussion a couple of times about this, our chairman said that the, the commissioners in the past have had meetings in the afternoon and I just want to make, you know, get some clarity to that. This board has never had a, since, since as far as I can go back was the 2012, since 2012, it, and that's what's listed that I was given for the afternoon's meetings as well, was 2012. Um, never had a board meeting in the official board meeting in the afternoon. Those meetings were specially called meetings. Um, one was August 27, 2012 at 6 p.m. That was on a Monday. Another one was September 17, 2012, 6 p.m. on a Monday. Another one was January 3rd, 2014, 5 p.m. on a Monday. December 1st, 2014, 4.30 p.m. on a Monday. February 18th, 2015, 1 p.m. on a Wednesday. March 6th, 2015, 2 p.m. on a Friday. Um, just want to make that clear that our chairman said something to this board and said something in the public that just wasn't true. We, there's, they've never tried afternoon meetings as far as our regular board meeting go. Several citizens in the past have come forth and asked for it, but it's never happened. Um, so just wanted that to be clear and be on the record that this is, that's what I was given. That's the research that I did. And, uh, you know, we, we passed something for four meetings, which is, isn't a whole lot out of a year to be in the afternoon. I kind of sort of thought it was ridiculous, but hey, I, I, you kind of sort of take what victories you can get at this point. But um, I just wanted to make sure that the public knew, knew that we've never had meetings in the afternoon to this date. That wasn't a special call meeting. Because during, during all those months, we still had our two regular meetings on this first and second Tuesday, first and third Tuesday of each month. Madam Clerk, can you verify those dates? Those were the dates that I discovered in the notes from the previous clerk. There have been no afternoon meetings. These were, it was my understanding by reading her notes that those meetings on Monday night were to replace regular meetings. But. No, all the regular meetings were still, as far as the agenda goes and everything were still um, happened during each one of those months I checked. Um, and I did all of that in a matter of minutes, so that could have possibly been checked before it was given to me. They could have been special call meetings, but I can assure you we didn't have a commissioner's meeting on Monday night and have another one on Tuesday. I was here. I can assure it you may, that it you may had not a be special in the, call It may not meeting. be in the notes, but I'm just saying I can we never you. had a commissioner's meeting on Monday and then had another one on Tuesday. I can Tuesday. assure you that you had a special call meeting on one night and turned around the next night and had a regular, that next morning, had a, net, a regular meeting. We had we scheduled some special call meetings and if what we call community meetings because we went around in different parts of the community and but those were not board meetings, sir. 
And that is a fact. Look it up. Well, it doesn't make any difference. We've already decided to have uh, nine hey, hey, meetings look, once next, again, next I just year. To so make sure, as as I just wanted deal. to make sure that the public knew that obviously you didn't know what you were talking about. Well, that's, let's put it this way. There has never been but one perfect man on the earth and nail him to a cross. Now take well, it or leave it. Sometimes it takes time to do research, sir. And that's what you should do before that's running your mouth. Hmm. Roll on. Move on, Mr. Pankett. Um Next is our consent agenda. Um, and again, that includes uh, the budget amendment that we walked on and the number nine uh, reimbursement resolution for Wayne Community College with appropriate budget amendment. So moved. I have a motion on the floor and a discussion. All in favor? Commissioner Gurley. Thank you. Oh, we're, we're raising. No, we don't mind. Yeah. All in favor, show a sign of right hand. All opposed? I vote you vote, sir. Opposed. Pardon? Uh, opposed. You oppose the. I did this. And under new business. Uh, presentation by Finance Director Allison Spade of quarterly financial statement for the County of Wayne fiscal year 2021-22 through September 30th, 2021. And I'll turn it down. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm presenting to you two reports today for the, a quarter July through September of 2021. Um, and so you've got a handout. This handout is different from what you see on the screen. The handout you have is, is a little more detailed information behind what I'm presenting today. When I present to you, I usually just do some highlights and then if you have further questions about what I've given you, please feel free to email me, call me, stop by, and I'll be glad to help you with any questions you have. This report that you have in front of you looks a little different than the ones I've given you historically. As you know, we changed software, so I'm still playing with the report format. If you have any suggestions or any other information you would like to see, I would love to have your feedback on that. So the first um, revenues I want to talk about are property tax revenues. <clears throat> this is through September, so we've not really hit our peak collection system, collection season. Uh, we've collected about $8.2 million for the year, which is $1.6 million more this time this year than last year. A couple of things um, that is, is a result of a tax rate increase that you all know about to support debt service. And then sometimes um, we do have some large taxpayers. If there's a timing difference, if they pay in September versus October, um, it'll throw our revenues off a little bit in timing, but overall it'll still be there. So sometimes we do have a little bit of a skew in our first quarter reports. We've collected about 14.7% of our budget, and um, obviously our high collections are going to be in December and January. So when I come back to you in probably about mid-January with our six-month report, these numbers will look a lot more robust than they do right now. May I interrupt? Sure. I'm confused. Uh-oh. Already? <laughs> already. Is, already. Is this a quarterly report? Yes. Wouldn't it be from July 1? Yes. It is July through September. Well, what I'm seeing through the end of September, uh -huh. but this is saying uh, September 30th to date she said this at the top of mine. Where are you seeing that? She's, he's on this paper. On this paper. Oh. So, so what this is. That really is last year's number. So you're seeing on the column, the paper you're looking at, Okay. The first page, I've got it right here. Um, you, the first column you're looking at is a September 30th, 2020, 20 to date actual. Then the next column is September 30th, 2021, to date actual. That first row, 8.2 million, right. that's what you see right there on the screen. It collected 8.2 million for the year. Is that what you mean? It, it, it is. Uh, <laughs> but it is actual for the quarter. Yes, okay. it is. Okay. All right. Good. It is. 
feel free to stop me if you have any other questions. <laughs> um, I am, like I said, I'm playing around with the report format, so I don't, I don't mind some feedback. Um, vehicle taxes, which would be the next row on your report that you have in front of you, is um, collected about 2.1 million to date. So that's July through September. Um, it's about 192,000 more this year than last year. Vehicle taxes are affected by our tax rate, so do keep in mind that um, that, that covers all property taxes. And we've collected about 29.26% of our budget. Uh, vehicle taxes are not quite as seasonally collected as our property taxes are, so um, we are a little bit ahead of um, budget percentage-wise at this time. All right, sales tax. So, um, sales tax would be um, if you see if you're looking on your report, you see four lines. Sales taxes, Article 39, 40, 42, and 44. So those are the four articles that make up our sales tax. There is another one I'll talk about in a second that's a little bit of an outsider. Um, so on this chart, you can see that um, our sales taxes are doing great. Um, we did have a dip in May of 2021. Of course, that was that was during the COVID pandemic. So uh, we were none of us in the state really. I don't think were hit as hard as we expected we would be. Um, we've collected about 7.3 million dollars to date. This is an increase of 824,000 over this time last year, and we've collected a little over 30 percent of our budget. So what this chart represents is our last 18 months of collection. I, I do like to give this just for perspective on where we, where we are over a longer period of time. Um, and so let me talk for a second about this last line on that first page of your report, sales tax, Medicaid, home, hold harmless. It's abbreviated on your report. So a um, little bit of a history. There was a sales tax article that was um, remitted to the state instead of counties back several years ago. And this was when I believe um, Medicaid was overhauled. Does this sound familiar, Borden? And so um, the way this worked is that revenue was withheld from counties when the state took over Medicaid. And that was gonna help cover the cost of the state running this program. Well, what they decided to do as part of that is that they would hold the counties harmless. So this meant if the cost of running that program um, exceeded that revenue that was collected, then we would not see anything out of that. But if your county revenues that for that article of sales tax, if the revenue started to exceed the cost of carrying that program for your county, then you will receive a portion back. Now, we have not received any until this past year. And I did not budget very aggressively for it because, to be honest with you, when we received it, I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> we had not, it, it, this was enacted back in, I think, 2006, 7, 8, somewhere along there, and we have never received it. So, um, actually, when we saw this hit our bank account, <laughs> I didn't know if it, I wasn't sure it was ours. I said, what is this for? Um, so, we, I did some research, talked to the Department of Revenue, and so, with the rising sales tax the way it has been, and of course this um, Wayfair um, legal case that allowed us to collect online sales tax has certainly helped. Our sales tax has risen to the point where now our revenues have exceeded the cost to the state of, how, of managing that Medicaid program. So the good news is this has become more money for us. Now, I can't tell you that this will happen every year because this is the first time it's happened. Um, I budgeted extremely conservative for this fiscal year. <laughs> Mr. Daughtery likes that word. Um, so how this works is similar to how you've heard it work for the health department and for EMS with Medicaid. They give you a 90% amount of what they think that you are owed. Then they do a desk audit and retain 10%. And then after that desk audit, they will remit the remainder. Or they may determine you owe them back some money, and then you owe them back some money. So I actually set that money aside when we first received it until we received our first desk audit. And what you see as the actual to date, September 30th, 2021, that is the 10% that we received in addition from last year. We received a little over 600000 last year. So I wanted to give you, I, I did not say anything about this when we first received it because it was, I, I wasn't really even sure we were supposed to get it. So I wanted to do my homework and make sure that this was in fact money that was owed to us. 
But as far as uh, setting a trend or knowing whether we will receive this every year, I'm not sure. But I felt like since we have gotten through this first audit, now this money is ours, and I wanted to show it to you all and explain what it is. So I'll keep you updated. I think we'll receive our next portion in March, and I'll kind of keep you updated on maybe like what our trend is, if it's grown, if it's decreased, that type of thing. Okay. So I got a question on this. Sure. Go to 7.3 million to date, and, you, and it says overall collection, average collection is at 30.26 percent of budgeted. So. I guess I'm, I'm asking, what, what's the, the 30 percent, what's it based off of figure? It's based off of what we have collected through September compared to what we budgeted in total. So when I look at the first quarter of the year, I say, okay, we're 25 percent through the year. Okay. Most of my revenues that come in evenly should be about 25 percent at least of collected. Sales tax. And sales tax is actually at 30 percent. So what that tells me is we're actually on track to collect more than what we budgeted for the year. So, okay. so am I thinking like 21 or 2? I'm sorry? What, so how much do you think we're going to collect? Well, um, let's see. What are our articles? Um, we got 9, 6, 15, and 21, 22. It, it's really hard to tell. Right now is so early in the year. And see, we've, we've not hit our high season. You've got to get through the, I mean, once we hit our Christmas season, right. our shopping season, we'll probably have a better idea of what that'll look like. If we're at 30 percent now, I mean, I think that's a good indication that we will exceed budget for the year. But I, I don't know any way of knowing this early on how much. Um, so I hate to be vague, but it's it's so hard. Again, this what I'm asking is, what what is your what did you budget? What did, I mean, what do you think it's going to be? What was the total budget for the year? If you look under the third column of your report, 2021 revised budget. So you'll see for each of those articles, I've got a certain amount budgeted okay, gotcha. and that shows you and it's about I think it's around 22 million dollars well, that's what I was when it came up to yeah 22 20, 23 million dollars I was right okay. well and mr. chairman also I'd like to point out during the first quarter of the year generally sales decline and so our revenues decline as right well. so and, and that's why I'm saying like I, I think it's a good sign if we're already a little above budget I agree. um but it's it's still a little early to tell uh -huh. Quick question, do you have the register of these numbers for um, I do not. I, I mean, we can certainly um, we can certainly get those to you. So typically in the past when I've done um, quarterly reports, it's at a very high level. It's not broken out like by department or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But certainly if you want further details on any individual department revenues or expenditures, I'll be happy to give those to you. Okay, thank you. Sure. So we're looking possibly to collect about a little over two point four million more dollars in sales tax this year. Is that possibly? Okay. <laughs> is I'm just I'm Mr. Just really Daughtery will tell you it is a little early for me to guess. Okay. I'm just I'm just running numbers in my head. I'm just okay. Gosh, just I just want to make sure I'm looking at it right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions on sales tax before I move on? It was, yeah. I'd also I'd like you to revise your uh, reports to actually show the uh, revenue specifically earmarked for the schools. Okay, I can do Since that. Since the chairman's sitting right back there. Good no. <laughs> I think that'd be good information okay. to see how much additional is going from our sales tax for specifically for school. Okay, sure will. And just to give a little bit of an explanation of that, so um, you have two articles where you see these article numbers in the sales tax column. There are two articles that um, do have a formula attached to them for a required set aside for it's either school construction or debt service for school construction. And so what happens is we are required we, we receive those monies, but then we put that in a special um, a separate fund. It's our fund 113, and we house those monies there just for school construction or debt service for school construction. So um, if you ever hear about the required set aside out of sales tax money, that's what we're talking about. And I'll be happy to put that on my um, reports for next time. Okay, just other updates. Um, I did want to let you all know we are in our ongoing, uh, we are in our ongoing process of our annual audit for 630-2021. Um, 
a lot of the field work has already been done over the last several weeks. Um, we're wrapping up outstanding items and those types of things, and we anticipate presentation of a report in January. So there is actually a new legislative requirement now that the report, once it is sent to the LGC, once it has a date on and it's submitted, um, it is required to be presented to you all within, I believe it's 45 days. So that has that's new this year. Now we've we've historically had our audit done pretty quickly. We usually like to wait till we receive LGC sign off on it, but um, this new legislative requirement, we, we may not be able to wait for that. It'll be sent to the LGC and then that clock starts ticking. So we'll make sure that we um, get that into you, but it will be a quicker turn and, turnaround than what we've typically done for presentation purposes. Um, I did want to give you a little bit of update on ARP. Unfortunately, it's not, um, it's not very detailed. We are still awaiting final guidance. The last update that they gave us was that our final guidance would come well into the fall. And as Kara Malanzi said, we're pretty well into the fall. <laughs> We've not seen anything. Um, so we're just kind of waiting. Um, I think if the state budget could get passed, that would really help us be able to move on our county decisions because that's really what's um, going to be a game changer possibly for us in terms of if we have any additional flexibility with broadband and what kind of money the state might put forth for sewer projects. So um, I think even if the Treasury guidance isn't out, if we could see some movement on the state budget because that ARP money is tied to the state budget, that would be very helpful. Now, um, in the legislative update I received last week, it was suggested that if a state budget does not pass soon, we may start to see the mini budget bills come out. And so my hope is if that's the case, that they will do one for the ARP funding and we could see some movement on that. So that's all I have for you, unfortunately, on ARP funds, but I, I did want to let you know where we stood with that. Let's hope the budget passes. I'm sorry? Let's hope the budget passes. Yes. Yes, I think that's, yes, absolutely. 40, 49 other states has passed theirs. Yeah. Um, so are there any questions on county before I move forward to tourism? Okay, if not, I'm going to move to the Tourism Development Authority. Uh, this is also for the quarter July through September. I present this all to you because um, we are a separate entity. Um, and so we have to have our own audit. We have to have our own budget. Um, we have our own board. And, um, but I am the ex officio finance officer, so I, I feel an obligation to present these statements to you all. Um, and so this entity is from, is in, we manage it within the county books and QuickBooks, and so um, I do have to report on it separately from the county financial statements. Um, we, re we have finished up our audit for the Tourism Authority um, for the fiscal year end of 2021, and it, we received an unmodified opinion. So what that, that's good. So that's a good thing. Um, that means there was no material misstatements, and um, you've also probably heard it called a clean opinion. That's another um, term for it sometimes. Collections at year end were 19800 over budget. Um, and I have to say, this was a really big win for us because tourism authorities occupancy taxes in general were hit really hard with COVID. Um, so even though we did not see the same decrease in sales taxes, occupancy taxes were hit pretty hard. Fund balance increased by $16,300. This was due to our revenues exceeding budgeted expectations and expenditures falling a little short of budgeted amounts. For this year, our revenues are $56,800 and they are trending above budget. Um, we're, our collections are up almost 13% above last year. Um, they picked up beginning in May, and, and we're seeing a steady increase year, over the year last year. Um, for 21-22, our budget was held constant since occupancy taxes were hit harder by COVID. We did decide to budget very conservatively. However, we do have a plan to revisit this budget mid-year if we start to see a real pickup or we feel like we need to uh, adjust our budget. Projected fund balance remaining at the end of the audit um, after fund balance appropriated for this fiscal year is around $42,000. And then I also did want to mention that um, as part of this occupancy tax agreement, 2% of the overall 6% from the city and county does go towards the Maxwell Center um, and helps offset with construction uh, debt service and things like that, operating costs and that kind of thing. And so the total we've received for this quarter is $105,000. And I'm sorry, that would actually technically be for last quarter. 
So this is all I have for Tourism Authority. Does anyone have any questions? All right, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Good job. Um, number three under new business is motion to approve memorandum of understanding for the mobile library project. Uh, again, that is on page 63, and we did go over that in the pre agenda. If there's any questions, I think Donna and Megan are still here. You want to have any questions on yeah. that? Is an action, yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion that we approve that item. I have a motion on the floor. We approve item number three. Any discussion? Uh, Commissioner Williams. Williams. And, oh, I'm sorry, you haven't voted. No, sorry. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, sure, sign the right hand. And then we do have number four, motion to approve CAG contract pending approval from the county attorneys and 911 board and appropriate budget amendment. Again, this is what we talked about as far as putting everything into one uh, software solution. Mr. Chairman, I move uh, approval of the CAD contract pending approval of the county attorneys and 911 board and appropriate budget amendment. I have a motion on the floor. Any discussion? If no discussion, all in favor show sign of right hand. Any opposed? Um, okay, county manager's report. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, first, I did want to introduce uh, Randy Rogers, uh, who is here. Uh, Randy, please come up. Uh, Randy has been our interim director at the landfill. Uh, Randy went through the process, and uh, uh, we have uh, selected Randy to be uh, our new director at the landfill. Randy's got over 30 years service, extensive service at the landfill. He was operations director before. Uh, just a wealth of knowledge, and we're very excited that, that Randy's willingness to step forward and into this position, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, so. Mr. Honeycutt. Mr. Commissioner, thank you, and Mr. Chairman, um, all commissioners. Um, I do look forward, uh, you know, leading the solid waste department. Uh, we are in a good place with our solid waste department in the county. Um, so, you know, looking at different programs and moving forward you know, with the environmental restrictions that solid waste entry is under, you know, which we're always um, trying to move forward and obviously doing it in a very respectful and environmental concern with the county. Uh, we have a very great staff at the landfill our convenience centers um, through the COVID uh, problem that we had, they really stepped up to the plate and uh, worked, you know, day in and day out to keep the convenience centers open and uh, our department moving forward. Uh, once again, I look forward to, uh, you know, uh, keeping our department going in a positive direction. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. We do appreciate it. And just one quick announcement, and, and I mentioned it earlier as well, but we do have our economic development announcement um, on the Shell Building, uh, which will be tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, at Wayne Community College. So, uh, but it is a very good win for the county. Uh, so. Uh, uh, we should have some uh, representatives from the governor's office as well from the Department of Commerce. So it's a, it's a good win for the county. Mr. Chair, that's all I have this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner's committee and comments, uh, Mr. Darty. I uh, attended the Jetport uh, uh, Commission meeting and of course the uh, $3 million plus rehab project is going to actually begin in the spring. Now that's going to really take a good bit of, of scheduling to where we're going to break that up into two sections, uh, half of it and then the other half. Um, but at any rate, uh, that's, a, that's a big plus for, for the Jetport. 
Uh, I do want to let the board know that over the last uh, many months, there have been negotiations going, been going on uh, regarding the change of the bylaws of WCDA. And at our last meeting, which was last Wednesday, uh, those modifications were approved. Um, what this does, uh, it changed the appointments uh, to where one Goldsboro at, uh, the City Council and the Mount Olive Board uh, each have an, a, an appointment. I don't know why the WCDA was not set up in such a way to where uh, Goldsboro City Council actually had an appointment on this board. So many times they did not or was not aware of any uh, industry recruitment or any announcements prior to the time. Uh, it's just a real plus to have the Goldsboro City Council as well as Mount Olive Board each have an individual appointment. And that, I think that goes into effect next June or July. I'm not sure when the rotation starts. Um, the Board of Commissioners uh, have four appointments. Uh, however, there is a limit to two sitting commissioners. Several years back, I think there were three that were on the board and it created some pushback from some of those investors of saying it was beginning to get too political. So uh, the compromise here was to four commissioner appointments with a limit of two sitting commissioners. Uh, I attended, of course, the health board meeting, and as we saw today, those uh, numbers uh, of three, three point two one percent is our positivity rate, which is substantially below the five percent that the state has, in fact, recommended uh, before some of these policies uh, be removed. These restrictions. Um, the vaccination site is up and running. They've just done a remarkable job uh, with facilities and, and all, uh, all of the departments to get into that building and actually get it up and running. And I've just heard some great positive comments in regards to that operation. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Barbara Acuff. Uh, I also was at the WCDA meeting, and uh, after hearing uh, Mayor Ham do his presentation, I was not aware that they were not a part of it, and it's a shame that they were not, because they were asked to participate and provide money, and they were not notified, really, why they were asking for money. Also, uh, I'd like to thank Kendall Lee's staff for the movement and getting everything set up. I mean, we cannot say enough for his staff and the hard work that they do. I want to commend his staff, I mean, because that was a big move, getting everything set up for the, the health center. And I want to personally thank you, Kendall, for that. It was uh, very helpful uh, for the health department to get everything set up for them. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Acock and uh, Commissioner Gurley for getting the trailers, and hopefully in the future that will help. Uh, some alleviate the labor that was put in forth and another move that might happen pretty soon. Um, another thing, this is uh, a trend that I'm seeing here on the board. I, I don't know whether to say anything or not because I don't want to cause any discord or anything, but I think we're losing focus on what we need to do here instead of pointing fingers. I think we need to be in cohesive with one another. I want this board to work together because we've got a lot of work to, to do, and I think discord is going to slow us down on some of the progress we need to make. And we just we need to stay focused and, and understand that each member of this board is here for one reason, and that's to do the betterment of our citizens, the staff, and for the commissioner board. And that's all I got to say on that. We need to stay focused on what our duties are here as commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Williams. Thank you, sir. Um, not to point fingers, 
I think overall, um, as a commission, we're all going to have different perspectives on things. We're never going to agree um, on a lot of issues. However, um, I was disappointed in regard to the mass. Um, I think that when you look around the county and you see the devastation that has occurred um, with families losing members, with jobs, job loss. When you look around, you see help wanted signs everywhere. You look around, you see now hiring. That's why, in my opinion, I believe it's very important that we would have tried to, to do as much as we could do pertaining to masks. When you go to businesses, you see how slow the process is when you're ordering food, when you're trying to check out from the grocery stores. That's because it's a lack of employees. And some of that process has been because of people who have died. We've lost people who had those jobs. Um, we've, we're having people that are sick. We're having people that are even afraid to come out. So. Again, like I say, too much is given, much is required. And I believe this board was in a position to uh, slow down the process of other individuals getting sick. When you look at other cities throughout this country, they put serious mandates down. And it's helping. It's helping. And it makes good business sense. It makes good business sense. So. You know, I think we dropped the ball here today. I, you know, a lot of times we, in my opinion, we're not leading. You know, it seems as though we're following, you know, and we have to figure out, are you a leader or are you a follower on this board? Also, uh, I said I wouldn't stop Mount Olive with their water sewer issues. It still exists. They need help. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Foster. No comment. Commissioner Gurley. Yes, sir. Um, a couple, three weeks ago, uh, I went to Eureka to, uh, uh, to acquire their sewer maps, uh, brought them back to, uh, um, back to our on uh, GIS and who we have buried, they uh, put them in a digital format. Uh, we have them now. Uh, Kendall and myself rode back, uh, looked around, just just in about 30 minutes, found a few places that we that there's some major issues. Um, uh, he's in the process of kind of getting some things together to uh, uh, to, to try to figure out it, uh, if we can see where some of the problems may uh, may exist. Uh, next thing is um, I'm still uh, lobbying for uh, volunteers for our volunteer fire departments. Um, like I say, most uh, Monday or Tuesday nights, you'll see cars at a fire department in your respective community. Just stop in, uh, speak to them. Uh, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Uh, a lot of them are people that you know and see on a regular basis from all walks of life, and uh, we'd love to have you as a volunteer. Uh, next thing is I got a... Uh, a note from a, a good friend of mine, uh, Ben Seegers, uh, the uh, Salvation Army Red Kettle uh, campaign uh, is ongoing, uh, and there's about 3,000 one-hour time slots, and as of yesterday, 194 of them have been filled. So I'm going to challenge all of elected officials uh, on this board uh, and other boards in the county county employees, directors, uh, to uh, sign up. Uh, it's an hour, or you can sign up for more, but it's an hour, and uh, uh, you'll be blessed um, for sure, and you'll bless other people by your presence being there, because a lot of times people that, that see people that they know, they'll come there giving money to somebody that they don't know. Uh, so that's um, uh, next thing. I want to um, uh, wish everybody a uh, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, coming up very quickly. Um, uh, kind of looking forward to a couple of days 
off, hopefully. Uh, and the next thing I'm looking forward to is the Christmas parade. So um, uh, there's uh, there's things to come in the near future. So uh, that's all I got, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Harris. Well, I've got a few things here to Mr. Chair. Um, last Friday, I attended the um, Habitat for Humanity's uh, annual breakfast. And people, if you're unaware of Habitat for Humanity, what they're doing, please, it's their annual donation period. So please, please sign up. But anyhow, just to make a quick impact statement here, uh, since, night, since um, 2001, over 1 million $800,000 has been generated by uh, Habitat for Humanity here in Wayne County alone. There's 85 new homes built, 25 we repaired, and 170 families have been um, participated in, in the program. Now I'm going to move on to a, a few things. Commissioner Acock stole my thunder here. Kimmel, congratulations to you and your staff. You guys did a great job with, with that move. And also Commissioner Acock and Commissioner uh, Gurley, Again, thank you guys for standing on top of the trailers because that was something that was on the bike burning for a while. And I think most of us have forgot about it. So thank you guys for doing that. Ms. Acock mentioned discord on the board. And I have to agree with her. But I'm going to tell you, the one thing that can get rid of the discord, if you have a problem, just pick up the phone and talk to one another. That's all it takes. You know, people have a problem with me. I don't know they have a problem with me because they don't talk to me. So just pick up the phone man, woman, or whatever, and talk to one another. It's that simple. Go out for a cup of coffee. That's all you have to do. As for the mask mandate, uh, after my last vote, my phone was, was filled with calls about why I did it. I did it based upon the research and uh, the scientific evidence of the uh, UNC system. And again, I think we should have waited until after the flu, flu season, but the vote was taken, the vote was made, and the vote. So that, that's, the, that's why I made my decision. If you notice, I voted for the mandate, but I voted once we established the ground rules, not for it. And um, let's put it to bed. People, you've got to take the politics out of this thing. And this is what it's coming down to, politics. Take the politics out. What's best for you and your family? What's best for you and your friends? You know, if you haven't got your booster shot, get your booster. If you haven't got a shot, you haven't been immunized, period, go do so. But just take the politics out of the thing, and let it, <clears throat> and let's do what's right for the citizens of Wayne County. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Oh, one other thing. Yes, sir. I'm sorry here. Uh, the Veterans Day Parade. I want to thank our, our veterans and for what they've done and, and their, their service. However, uh, some of you may have missed me on that day because I went early, talked to some of those veterans, and realized as a county commissioner, I got no business sitting with those guys. You know, for what they've done for this country, what they've done for one another, what they've, they've, they've lost, I, I just felt that it was totally inappropriate for me to be, a, be up there. So I did watch the parade, did thank our veterans, but that's why you didn't see me. And that was a personal choice on my end. But these are some amazing folks, amazing folks. And the stories they don't tell you are even more amazing. All right, that's all I have, Mr. Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, First of all, uh, we are still in search of a president at Wayne Community College. Uh, we've gone about as far as the Board of Trustees as can go until we get the blessings back from the State Board, and we should have an answer back from them, hopefully this week, and then we can move forward. And we've narrowed it down to five candidates, and uh, <laughs> all five of them were, good, were pretty good. It's not going to be an easy uh, decision. But like I said, we are waiting back from the state board to uh, to approve. They will they will basically approve all five of them, and then we have the task of of choosing the one that we're gonna uh, ask to serve as president. Uh, also, uh, as some of the others have said, uh, I want to thank Kendall and his staff for the movement for the vaccine uh, site back out uh, out to the old food line. But also. Uh, I want to thank the other department heads. There was other departments that was involved that, you know, they didn't do the physical work, but, you know, uh, I'm proud of all of our departments in Wayne County. Uh, you know, we, we borrow stuff from the landfill, and we borrow stuff from Kendall, and we borrow stuff from here and yonder, and, and uh, you know, IT played a big part in it. I mean, you know, all of our departments deserve credit for, for that move. 
And for all, <laughs> as far as that goes, everything else that goes on in the county, because uh, our our employees, will, we sit up here and uh, agree, disagree, argue, fuss, but the work gets done by our employees, and I just want to thank all of you. Uh, I also, I did attend the Veterans Parade. Uh, I feel like that uh, it's my place to uh, respect them. My dad was a World War II veteran. My deceased wife's dad was a World War II veteran that got wounded. My wife, present wife's dad was a World War II veteran. Uh, I am not a veteran, uh, and I feel like it's my responsibility to show respect to them, to give, for giving me the freedom that we have in this country today. But sometimes you look back and think how much they sacrificed, and there's so many today don't appreciate it. Uh, I do. Uh, also, uh, we ought to respect to our veterans that are still living. Uh, we are a military community here. We have a lot of military families. And when they get out, they retire here. Uh, whether they saw active duty or not, they were still veterans. If you served in the military, any branch, you're you a veteran. Uh, some gave more sacrifice than others. Some gave all. But uh, we need to show our veterans more respect than we do sometimes. Uh, but uh, I think there was probably two World War II veterans at the Veterans Day Parade. Uh, they are getting few and far between. Uh, but they are no more important than the than the veterans of today. Also, uh, tonight is the uh, monthly Social County Firefighters Associating meeting. We'll be at Smith Chapel Fire Department at seven o'clock, and that's all I have. Anyone else have anything? We do need to go back in closed session. Well, we can do the work session first. Do the work we'll, session first, and then we'll go to the okay. closed session. All right. just notified us that she's driving in from Charlotte and there was a car accident and she's going to be about 15 minutes out. Yeah. So we, we probably got about 10, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. 10, if you want to take a recess, we'll take a recess and take a break. Yes, sir.
We're good. We have time to go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do want to uh, introduce Susan Manning. Uh, she is our HR consultant. Uh, to We hired to do a really comprehensive look at our paying class for the Sheriff's Department and detention. Uh, as the board is aware, this was a discussion we have had um, probably since about last January about pay within uh, the Sheriff's Department. I think this was one of the goals uh, that the board did list as something you wanted to address in the upcoming budget year. Um, but what Susan is here today is she'll talk about equity and, and some of the changes that we need to make adjustments on, look at other counties, look where we stand, and, and look at long-term moving forward. Um, but again, I wanna thank Susan for being here. Uh, if you remember, Susan also did our EMS study as well, and we will um, also engage with her on our DSS and health as well. Uh, hopefully that we'll have some um, uh, changes for the upcoming budget year as well. So, but, but Ginger, did you want to say? Thank you all. I'm very excited to be able to stand in front of you. And classification study for the Wayne County Sheriff's Office. It was a labor of love. Uh, it was. It took a village really to pull this together. At its most basic level, you know, salary studies help us see wage comparisons and market trends and fluctuations, and it helps us kind of see how we stack up to other agencies um, externally, and it helps us see how we compare internally also. So law enforcement and detention generally is highly competitive anyway. And then when you start kind of drilling down into local levels, it's even more competitive because we're all competing for the same talent pool. So Susan Manning, we could not have had a better uh, person to guide us through this project. So I'm not gonna take any more of her time. I'm gonna turn this over to Susan. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure to work with Wayne County on um, both the EMS study and the Sheriff's Office study. Right. And I want to extend my thanks and appreciation to the Sheriff and his staff and Ginger and her staff uh, it truly was a, a partnership effort uh, on our part um, to address some of the issues and concerns uh, that um, the county was facing in the area of law enforcement and detention salaries. So I'm going to uh, go through my slides. Uh, I have a couple of handouts that we'll, uh, we'll detour and cover as I go through. Um, and also we'll have some time for questions at the end. But I'll... Um, I wanted to start by just saying I come to you with uh, more than 30 years of HR public sector experience. I was the HR director in Mecklenburg County for almost 14 years before I retired. And since then, I've been an HR consultant and I work with municipalities and counties across the state. And um, so I was really um, privileged to have an opportunity to work with Wayne County. But we want to start by talking about uh, the beginning of this study. Uh, to talk about the purpose, as Ginger said, was to look at the salaries and the salary ranges in Wayne County's uh, detention uh, and law enforcement area in the sheriff's office to see whether we, we were competitive with the external market. We wanted to be sure that our ranges were competitive, that we were in paying our employees competitively and equitably based on their qualifications to both reduce pay compression and to improve employee morale. And finally, we wanted to implement compensation changes to reduce turnover and improve retention. Because when you lose talented, experienced staff, it's very difficult to replace them in the labor market that we find ourselves in right now. Um, we started the study in the spring and um, the market has only gotten more competitive as unemployment has come, come down and um, people are exploring other career opportunities and so it makes the market very competitive for all of us employers, but especially in local government in North Carolina. So we had some goals for the study. We did it in two phases. Uh, the first phase, as uh, the county managers already alluded to, you heard about during your budget process, where we wanted to look at uh, the external market, the regional market that Wayne County finds itself in, where you have to recruit uh, for staff. Um, we wanted to try to facilitate the recruitment staff because you've had a lot of turnover, and we also wanted to try to improve retention. 
And to do that, we wanted to have competitive salary ranges and we wanted to pay employees competitively based on their qualifications. And in phase two, once we finished the market part of our study, we, the sheriff <coughs> had asked us to look at pay compression issues. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to, to the phase two part of the presentation. But basically to look at how our employees are being paid commensurate with their qualifications and experience across the salary ranges for the job classes. And we want to look at internal equity to be sure people are paid properly in relationship to each other in order to, again, improve morale and retention. So the first stage of the market study was a, um, a competitive compensation uh, salary survey. We sent it out to 20 public sector entities in the, re the eastern region of North Carolina. 12 counties, four municipalities, and four state agencies. Because all of those uh, entities of local government and state government compete for the same talent when it comes to law enforcement. So we wanted to take a broad view of that market uh, and how we stacked up in comparison. 14 of the 16 local agencies responded to the survey, which is an 88% response rate, which is very good. Um, and we got the state agency salary data from the Office of State Human Resources. Uh, we used 18 benchmark job classes in the sheriff's um, office and in the detention facility, uh, mainly covering all of your law enforcement classes and all of your detention classes. We included six additional compensation questions uh, to get a better handle on how other agencies were compensating their law enforcement and detention staff. And we uh, also obtained supplemental data from the uh, UNC School of Government and the Office of State Human Resources. We completed the study we began in March and we completed it in May in time for the manager's budget presentation. And as I, I think he's already alluded to, some of this has been discussed with you. But just to give you a, a high level review of how we got to where we are, this salary study went out to um, these local governments, um, Brunswick, Carteret, Harnett, Johnston, Lenore, Moore, Nash, and Orange, Pitt, Wake, and Wilson County. And I basically just looked at counties that were surrounding you all and in which you are competing for talent. And then we had um, four municipalities, I'm sorry, I left off the city of Garner, uh, were the four municipalities, Goldsboro, Greenville, Wilson, and Garner, to try to look at different municipalities in this region that, um, again, are similar staff to ours. So when we send a survey out, what information are we requesting? We want to see the actual, actual salaries being paid for each benchmark class. When I talk about benchmark classes, I'm talking about your deputy sheriffs, your sergeants, your lieutenants in the detention series, the detention officers, and again, uh, the rank positions. So we want to look at the actual salaries being paid by each of these uh, municipal and uh, county state governments across, across the region. We want to know the number of employees they have in each job class, because that gives us a sense of the size and scope of their departments. And we want to look at their salary ranges for each job class, the minimum, the midpoint, and the maximum. And when all this data comes in, we compile it together and we calculate a market rate for each job class. So we do that by averaging the actual salaries being paid in the market for that job class. So what is uh, uh, Wayne County paying aver on average for all their deputy sh uh, sheriffs? What, are, what is Wayne paying on average for their detention officers? And then we sometimes adjust, do an adjusted market salary rate to exclude outliers. And so let me give you an example of what that might be. So obviously there's some larger counties than Wayne in this survey. There are also some smaller counties. But if you look at the, um, what the, um, the majors are being paid in Wake County, that's a, much, that's a larger county, larger size department. And so we might take out the, Wayne <coughs> count, uh, the, the uh, Wake County data for those higher level positions because again, size and scope of that job may not match apples to apples to a major's position in a smaller county. 
And then we compare the market rate, that market rate that we have calculated for each job class, to the midpoint of your current salary range to determine if your range is above the market, at the market, or below the market. And then we have something we call a market range, which you want your uh, you want your midpoint to be within that market range, which is plus or minus 5%. So it helps us determine whether at this point your salary ranges are competitive. A little bit about the methodology. I won't delve into that too much, but I'll be happy to answer any questions um, later about that. So when we looked at all the compiled data from these um, 14 municipal governments and the state government agencies that responded, um, of the 18 salary, uh, the 18 benchmark jobs that were in the survey, 17 of those salary ranges were below market. So 94% of your salary ranges in Wake County compared to the market were below the market average. You had no salary ranges that were at or above market, and you had one salary range which we, where we did not get enough data to really calculate a market rate. So, um, and most of those salary ranges were either on the low end, 5% below the market rate, or as much as 15 to 20% below the market rate. And I will tell you, I've been in the consulting business now for about 14 years in North Carolina. I only work with North Carolina municipalities. And um, we, and this, this is somewhat unusual to have this many salaries below the market rate. And in discussions with the sheriff's office and, and with the, the uh, county manager, it's been a long time since there's been a salary study done. And this is what happens when you get behind um, you find that sort of across the board, everything is below market. Um, so we made some, uh, we, we went on to look at how are you paying your competitive, your employees within those ranges. So not only did we find that the salary ranges were below market, we looked at employee salaries being paid and we looked at them both, were they competitive with the market and were they above or below the median? So the median is the 50th percentile and in most cases your average actual salaries were falling below the median. So you're paying below the 50th percentile and it's very difficult to be competitive when your salaries um, are, not, are not close to the median or close to the market. And those are your average salaries, not each individual salary. So I had to take a somewhat unusual step of taking Wayne County's salary data out of the calculations because since your salaries were very low, your average actual salaries were very low, you were actually impacting the overall market rate and pulling it down. So you have to compete in that market. So I wanted to look at, okay, what's the true market out there without the, without the Wayne County data? And then we looked at it, of course, with the Wayne County data. Most of your salaries are in the lower quartile of the range, which creates both compression, so everybody's grouped down on the lowest end, and it makes recruitment and retention very difficult. And I, I'd like to ask you to look at a handout that I think the clerk distributed um, and we'll just look at one of these, but there, there are actually two examples just to show you a visual of where your minimum salaries, the minimum of your salary range, which is where you hire most deputies and detention officers. You start them at the minimum and then, you know, you, you hopefully hang on to them and, and move them through their range over time. But if you look at the deputy sheriff job classifications before we did the study, these are all of the 14 municipalities that responded, and you will see that Wayne County was next to the bottom. So when I say you're in the lower quartile of the, ra of, of the ranges, this is what I mean. You are next to the lowest. And the only one lower than you was Lenore County, which I think is a neighboring county. And one, we did not, did not use Lenore County in the survey, I mean, we did use Lenore County in the survey, but they are also doing a salary study at the same time we were doing a salary study. So they knew they were low, and they, in fact, in almost every example, were 
one level below Wayne County, and Wayne County was almost always next to the bottom. And you see a similar pattern when you look at the detention officer uh, example. So um, once you approved, as part of the budget process, uh, that as the, man the manager presented his budget, uh, the uh, approval for the recommendations, I put on the bottom what your starting minimum salary will be for your deputy sheriffs and your detention officers once we implement the study recommendations January 1st, as I think is the plan. The new minimum salary for your um, de uh, deputy sheriffs will go up almost, uh, a little over $4,000, about $4,500, and you will move from being next, almost at the bottom, next to the lowest level, almost back up to the median. So you will be, uh, on this example, just under Cleveland County. Now, one caveat, um, other people did change ranges over the course of this time, so I can't guarantee you that this data is as of spring, and um, so you may not be quite this competitive um, because some, some jurisdictions did move their ranges and some did not, but we're giving you the data as it was presented to the manager back in May. Um, so you will come up to uh, club being close to the median on your minimum salaries and not quite to, you will be in the, the second quartile for your detention officer salaries. So, um, just a, a representation. Can I interrupt you here and mm -hmm. ask a question here? Probably over the county manager. This figure of 38,980 is basically what we approved in the budget for increases that go into effect January the 1st. Is that correct? What we did is, is we looked at the overall increases that were being recommended, and, and it was about a 10% increase. Okay. So what we did is we said, let's implement this as of January 1. So it will be only a five overall 5% 5 increase right now to the budget. But then when we pick up next year's budget, that's where we will get the other half. So it will be a 10% a increase January 1, but overall it's only a 5% increase to our budget because we started half the year in. Did that also include our, our raises that we gave to all employees? We did those, the 3% separate. We did the 3%. Yeah, that, that started at the beginning of the fiscal so year. So the 38,980 that we have here does not or does include the 3%. I don't think it does. And the reason I say that is, am I correct in saying that this was back in May when this was produced? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, but I aged your data taking into consideration your 3%. All right, so the 3% is included. Okay. That is included, yes, okay. so, because... Again, once you approved it, and then we did phase two, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute about compression, we had to go through and take into account that you had made adjustments both to the south, to the pay plan itself. So in this case, we're talking about the minimum hiring rate for a deputy sheriff. And that went up by 3% as well. So then we took that 3% and then we built in on top of that a 10 percent a 10 percent okay. and that's what takes us to the well, 38 I, I, I wondered how you got that high yeah. so <laughs> i just wanted to make sure we're all on the same right. page here that it does include those three because we tried to address it at budget time yes okay yeah and you did and this reflects okay. what you have already done okay uh what you have already approved thank you um and so i'll I'll go back to my slide, my presentation <laughs> slides. No, no, no. Good question. Very good really, question. Really, though, if if this included, we would have been in worse shape. We are. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and so I, I just wanted been to. Would close to Lenore County. So if we took Lenore County out, they, they we would be another twelve hundred dollars or so higher. So we would be at the thirty about forty thousand dollar range. If you Ground took figures. if you took them out of the right. average. since they're doing since they're doing a study right now, if you took them out of just yeah. yeah, and they implemented their study. I believe they implemented their study in July, so they brought their their ranges up as well. Um, but 
when um, we do got. We know, do we know what their ranges are? I do, but I don't. I don't have them in front okay. of me. But I did make sure that in the recommendations you were making, and the recommendations you, uh, the recommendations I was making, and the county manager was making, that you are still staying above what uh, Lenore County is, okay. is. And this is the minimum starting salary. This is correct? the minimum starting salary, correct. And if I'm reading that correctly, then that would put us, that would put us right below Cleveland County. Yes, sir. Uh, as of January 1, assuming none of them move their ranges. Now, I did not go back and resurvey, sure, sure, sure. But, uh, but yes. Which, which so you will move from being in the very bottom quartile right. to being what we say is at the median. So you'll be about the 50th percentile for your starting salaries for deputy sheriffs. Okay. All right. Um, so the compensation recommendations for phase one of the study just uh, would be to, was to increase salary ranges by on the low end 5%, but in on the top end, 10%. And almost all the salary ranges, I believe, were a 10% adjustment. And that included the 17 benchmark job classifications to bring them within that market range. Um, most salary ranges needed to move to be 10% to be competitive, at which the uh, manager alluded to. And then we wanted to look at, once we got the structure in place and we got the ranges set, how do we move our employees into those new ranges? And um, we looked at employees whose salaries now fall below the minimum of the new range. So if you were a deputy um, making, uh, at that time, 34,404, uh, as of January, we, we've got to get you to 38,980. So there was obviously cost involved with that for all employees who were below the minimum, bringing them to the minimum. But then we had some full-time employees whose salaries were just above the minimum. They were still in that lower first quartile, but they were above the minimum, but below the market. And the market is typically a, a line to your midpoint. And, um, and then we went back and looked at their qualifications and experience to be sure that they should be being paid up in the range based on the market data as well as their qualifications and experience. And this is where we had to do a lot of uh, work with the Sheriff's Department to get the qualification information and with Ginger staff as well. So those recommendations resulted in most em full-time employees of the Sheriff's Office being eligible for a 10% salary range consistent with the salary range mo uh, movement, not to exceed the midpoint of the range. So we try to, again, if you move the range up and don't move your employees up, that's when we create this compression problem. Everybody gets to the bottom of the range and you've got employees with no experience making the same thing as employees with five or six or more years of experience. So we, we tried to address that in the first phase of the study to move and keep people in the same relative positions of the range moving 10% and giving a 10% increase. But that these, was the- These salaries are just salaries, not benefit package or nothing like that. It's just salary. This correct? is just salary, okay. correct. Because as you, you probably know, in, in North Carolina, our benefit packages are very similar from county to county because of the right. state retirement system. Fine. Or law enforcement right and and that kind of thing so yeah these were just this is not what we call total compensation this is just looking at salaries and and these are range minimums these are they also are actual salaries of employees who are at the minimum of the range but uh, we talk about the pay plan structure looking at your ranges but then when we look at individual employees we have to look at their actual salaries and their experience and whether they're being compensated equitably. So the total cost for the total annualized cost for implementation approved by the board was 980907 and so the fiscal year cost was about half of that. Am, am I right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so I always give you the full annual cost and it, it, assuming you're going to implement you know, the beginning of July 1, say. But it is not uncommon to implement mid-year as you all opted to do. And then that first fiscal year, it doesn't quite hit your budget so hard. 
Uh, so once we made those recommendations, which was phase one, we made those recommendations, the manager included them in the budget, which you approved. Thank you very much for that support. Um, there were some continuing pay compression issues that we identified when we started looking at all these employee salaries and their qualifications that were not addressed by the market study. And so the sheriff uh, requested and the county manager authorized that we, I could go back and look in more detail at your employees because when you have pay compression issues and you have pay inequity issues, that affects morale. And when people are not happy, they start looking for other opportunities. And that's what we don't want to do right now is to lose staff in this market because it's very, very difficult to fill positions right now. So phase two is what we call the compression study. Our goal there was to conduct a salary equity analysis by job classification. So we looked at all deputy sheriffs in the same group. We looked at all detention officers in a different group. Um, we didn't compare every employee to every other employee. We looked at them within their job class to ensure that whether they worked in detention or they worked in law enforcement, uh, they were being paid equi equitably, commensurate with their qualifications, their experience, and their professional certifications. This phase two was conducted between June and August, so it overlapped the, uh, the budget year. And we made recommendations on this, um, this phase of the study to management at the end of August. So a little bit about phase two. So compression, salary compression, is a term that gets thrown around in HR circles, but what it simply means is when employee salaries are grouped or compressed at the lower end of the salary range without regard to employee qualifications. So you have a minimum salary, you have a, a midpoint or a market salary, and then you have a maximum. When most of your employees are grouped at the lower end of the range, they may have, you have brand new hires making similar to what someone that's been here five years doing that job as a deputy sheriff. There's nothing that causes more morale issues than employees that feel like they're not being valued for their experience, their expertise. And that was, the, that was what the sheriff was very concerned about, and rightly so. So um, it also makes it difficult to hire new staff because when the market is hot, hot and you've got to hire new staff, you've got to move your ranges up to be competitive. Otherwise, you can't hire them in this marketplace, um, and, um, or it's very difficult to hire them. And then you're hiring new staff, you're bringing them in right on top of your existing staff. And so, again, it creates internal morale issues for employees, but also creates market competitive issue for you when you try to go out to the market to fill positions. So the methodology, again, we grouped employees by job classification, so we looked at them according to their, their job titles, and we re reviewed their employee qualifications. We looked at their county hire date, their years of county service, their years in their current position, because obviously some people are hired in as deputies or detention officers and they're promoted up through the ranks. We also looked at their prior related law enforcement experience. It used to be um, in, the, in the field of, for sheriff and police departments, we never hired people up in the range. We, we just hired people straight out of BLET school and they all went up through the ranks together. But now, because there's a very significant shortage of candidates going through BLET school, we're having to look at hiring from other departments and other agencies to bring people in to fill positions. So prior related law enforcement or detention experience is very important. Finally, we'll look at the education and their certifications. And the most common certifications are intermediate law, for, for law enforcement positions, it's the intermediate and advanced law enforcement training. But there's also some specialized certifications if you're in criminal investigations, uh, uh, drug enforcement, that kind of thing. And then on the jail side, we have our jail certification training that we, we require for all of our officers. So uh, once we looked at all this data, which for 200, almost 200 employees, is a lot of information. And that's where my thanks go to the sheriff's staff and the HR staff because they really helped with all this. 
We looked at those, and we looked at those with similar qualifications and, and salaries and, uh, and identified potential inequities. So let me point you to your, your other handout that you had that the clerk handed out. This is just a, one example, a real life example from your study. Um, and, and just so you know, this didn't just apply to these, in, uh, these uh, rank and file deputies and detention officers. It also, we looked at it top to bottom in, in the sheriff's office. So you had a, a sergeant who had 25 years of experience. Um, five years as a sergeant with the uh, with the county, plus he had his advanced law enforcement certification, the highest certification you can get. His annual salary before we started the study was $45,900. That's not a whole lot of money when you've been working 25 years in your field and you have the highest certifications that you can get. Sergeant number two, Wayne County also, 12 years of experience, four years in the position, so almost as long as the first sergeant in the position, but half as much total experience. And he didn't have any certifications. And you can see he was making more than the first officer. So how did this happen? Well, over time, as people are hired, the market continues to move. And to be able to pay people, you have to hire people at a higher rate. And this is what happens because long-term people that have been here haven't necessarily kept pace with new hires coming in the door. And so this is, this is an example of, a, of both a certification issue, equity, but uh, um, because this second sergeant did not have any certifications and an experience <clears throat> in equity. Right below is an example of deputy, deputy sheriff um, 23 years plus advanced law enforcement was making 38,262. A deputy with six years, no certifications, making 39. And it's because you got to pay to get people to come. And then if you don't look at the internal equity issues at the time, they just tend to perpetuate them themselves. Let me, can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. how, how does it, and, and the sheriff could probably answer this, uh, I guess. How does it play into? Um, Say and of course, law enforcement officers are you know hard to come by, especially this day and time. And so you get like retired. It's not DMV motor carrier officers or highway patrolmen or or wildlife officers, for that matter. Anybody that's got a you know law enforcement certification. How does that play into the years of experiences? How does that, as far as pay, I guess I should say, is that? Oh, did she? Okay. okay. So she can that for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we looked at, in a, we looked at where had they come from, if they came to us from another agency and how many years of experience. And in some cases, we were paying them more, and that was okay because they had more experience right. total, uh, even though they didn't have as much experience with Wayne County. But um, that, was, that was something that I think has been, the sheriff has tried to address. When you are able to hire in experienced people from other agencies, you don't have to pay to train them. You know, you, you got to get them oriented to your department, but they can really hit the ground running, unlike somebody that you've got to bring in from the ground up. And I guess, yeah, and I guess what I'm asking is, without naming names, just certain people that has retired from another from a state agency do we have to pay their health insurance and, and all that stuff or is it already i mean is it paid you know since it was paid prior to do we still have to pay that too or they how does that they, can opt out of yes. they do opt out yes. okay so that saves us okay mm -hmm. okay so that's <clears throat> got, uh, so that's 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 a good thing. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's the reason I was asking to, to kind of, okay. Um, it doesn't save us on retirement if they come from a state agency, though, because as you probably know, you can get a state retirement and then you can come to the right. local system and you can get another retirement or you can you can roll But you're over. playing off to experience, but yet it's, you're, they're opting out of the health insurance, which is really a big savings, you know, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars a year. Right yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Also, I'm glad you, um, <clears throat> that we're doing a study because I can see that this definitely could play into low morale when you get some new new employees that come in and they're making more money than someone who's been here yeah. for, you know, a decade or two, right. you know, so. Um, and 
And one thing that I think also was part of the morale was how the certification increases were. Um, we did a new policy, I think in 2019, to award a 2% increase to a, um, you know, an employee who got an advanced certification in their field. But we implemented it going forward. So we had a lot of employees that already had those certifications that didn't get an increase at the time. And we didn't really, I think no one really fully realized the impact of that until we started looking at the data. And in, in a lot of cases, that was the, that was the, what it caused the inequity, is the, the person that was sitting there with an advanced law enforcement certification, they had never gotten their 2% increase because they had gotten it before the new policy went into effect. And so that was, that's part of what we're trying to address with this study is getting everybody to a level playing field, being paid equitably, and their certifications and their experience recognized. Well, I think people need to recognize there's some that, you know, there's some, and that's, it's just in all professions, there's some that, that don't want the responsibility as, as a leadership, so there's going to be a cap in a certain position that they're going to make, period. Absolutely, and, and that's what we know, call our maximum. Right. So they can't go beyond that. I will tell you, after doing all this, the re reviews with the recommendations that have already been made and those that I'm getting ready to make to you today, I think we only had less than 10, it may be less than five employees that end up with their salaries at the midpoint. So even with all the experienced people you have, most of them are still going to be in the first or second quartile below the median or below the midpoint. But yes, you are exactly right. If you don't advance through the, through the ranks and you don't, you're content to be a deputy or a detention officer and you don't want to do the additional work to get certifications, you're, you're going to max out at some point and that and that is perfectly and some people are fine with that but just you know but there is a right. max that we're going to and we did not re I did not recommend any salaries for any officer who was at midpoint or above that's part of when we do a market study if you're being paid at the midpoint already you're being paid competitively so we did not make a recommendation to award increases you just didn't have very many employees that were at the midpoint so it wasn't so much of an issue so we, we, do this, we did this analysis. I just gave you two very small examples but, um, to see kind of what we were looking at. And we determined by looking at their qualifications, looking at their current salaries, what type of salary adjustments needed, we needed to make to achieve some type of equity uh, with qualifications. And we did this analysis, equity analysis for all the detention positions, and we did a similar equity analysis for all the law enforcement positions. And then we identified a cost to achieve uh, those equity recommendations. So the study findings. Again, most employees were being paid in the first quartile and below the market for their qualifications, which creates this salary compression problem. More people cluster at the bottom of the range. The compression does not fully recognize the years of experience and other employee qualifications and makes it difficult to hire well-qualified employees when you do have vacancies. And salary inequities were a result of two major factors, one of which I've already talked about. The unequal rec recognition of professional certifications under your previous policy or your, under your current policy and the lack of recognition for experience, moving employees that were more experienced through the range. So the equity analysis and detention findings were as follows. Most in this case were a result of experience, the differences in experience uh, and appropriate salaries between peers. So um, the really in the detention facility, we only really have one major certification, that's the jail certification, right, sure. So I, I, my hat's off to the sheriff's office. They've managed that very well, and I did not see really any certification um, problems in the employees in the detention facility, but there were some differences because of experience. So 13 of the detention employees needed equity adjustments after doing this analysis. Uh, we looked at all the captains, and one captain, captain is in um, the detention facility and four in law enforcement, and so uh, we recommended an, 
equity adjustment there. And I, I said no certifications, but that's, in fact, the captains were a result of certification uh, adjustments that we needed to make. Six sergeants, three corporals, three master detention officers. So when you think about it, this is the heart of your detention facility, the leadership that's, that's trying to take care of, manage, provide safety and security both for employees and inmates. And the average equity adjustment in the uh, detention facility was 5%, based on experience primarily. So then we turn to the law enforcement positions. You have a lot more certifications there that were eligible under county policy to be <coughs> recognized. Most inequities were caused by this lack of recognition and reward for already approved certifications. Uh, but we also had some experience issues as well. So we went back and recognized all existing LEO certifications under our current policy, regardless of effective dates, and looked at what approved salary adjustments needed to be made to recognize those certifications. And those were 2% um, per certification. In most cases, there were few that were had multiple, but most of them were just a 2%. Um, and they were not retroactive. So we didn't go back and make them retroactive to whenever they got their certifications. This would just all be effective, whatever the effective date is for these recommendations. 17 law enforcement officers needed equity adjustments related to certifications. Again, um, your five captains, I think that's four and one, right, Sheriff? Um, four lieutenants, six sergeants, one corporal, and one master deputy sheriff. Now, the reason you didn't have as many, um, well, let me, let me do the next slide and then I'll go back and make that comment. So then we looked at inequities that were based on experience, uh, of employees' experience, different levels of experience. Twelve employees needed equity adjustments because they have more experience relative their, to their peers who are being paid a similar salary. Five lieutenants, two sergeants, one corporal, two detectives, two master deputy sheriffs. You talk about experience, is that years on the job? It's looking at both total law enforcement experience and experience in the positions that they currently hold. Okay. So when we looked at the lieutenants, we looked at just the lieutenants together. Okay. And then there were two, uh, there were a few employees, seven, that needed equity adjustments based on both certifications and experience. So their experience had not been fully valued and they had additional certifications that had not been rewarded. There were two lieutenants, two sergeants, two master deputy sheriffs, and one deputy sheriff, too. The average adjustments for experience were 2 to 3 percent. And when I'm talking about experience, we did not go back and look at it at the fine level of detail of employees from one to five years of experience. We only looked at the most experienced people, so like 10 to 15 years and 15 to 20 years. So. If we had gone down and dropped down to look at everybody with five years or more experience, it, the price tag would have been even more ex expensive. And we were already feeling like we were going to recognize some of those employees in the, in the larger study. So we looked at the most experienced staff to get them paid more equitably. And again, the adjustments for certifications were 2% for certification. So the implementation costs for phase two uh, which has not been included in the budget, right, Mr. County Manager? But, but there, there is funds available through lap salary that will cover um, this. Okay. So we, um, again, I'm giving you the annual cost. So the cost for the detention equity adjustments, there were 13 of those. The cost on an annualized basis is $28,704. For the law enforcement equity adjustments, there were 36 of those. The cost annually is $63,500. That includes, in addition to the actual salary cost, the additional benefit cost that we have to budget as well. So the additional cost for retirement benefits or the required um, 401k match. Um, and so the total annual implementation cost is for phase two of the study to address equity and compression issues is $92,204.
and the proposal is to implement December 1 prior to the, the phase one study implementation that is scheduled for January. And if we did that, seven, a seven month cost for that is $53,786, which as the manager said would be, um, could be paid from lap salary funds. Um, the reason we want to do this in advance of the, the overall phase one study recommendations is if you give everybody a 10%, which is pretty much what we're doing on the study recommendations, you will just perpetuate the inequity issue. You'll pull people even further apart. And so we wanted to try to get the equity issues addressed first based on their current salaries, which also is the most cost-effective way to do that, and then do the study implementation afterwards. And so we, we get the equity issues addressed first, then we put uh, implement the study implementations. And, and, and the other thing about doing it early on the uh, equity piece is that they'll reckon they'll see that increase within their budget. So if you just tell them, oh, you're getting this equity increase along with the, the salary adjustment January 1, it gets all lumped in. But by separating out those people who feel like that they may have been uh, had compression and inequities and not getting paid for certifications, this way they'll see it early within. They'll say, oh, I got this increase here uh, because of my time of service and my certifications. And then in January, they'll see the overall uh, Im implementation of the plan. Which I think is an excellent point uh, because otherwise it gets all blended together and they don't really know, well, what part of it was my equity adjustment and what right. part was this, this, the market adjustment. Right. So, uh, and I, we, uh, 49 employees would receive equity adjustments under phase two. So while almost all employees were, uh, will receive an increase under phase one, only about 25% actually would need an equity adjustment based on this on this this study and this analysis. So, so going forward, I mean, the other than that, until until you get with your other study, we're like looking at a million seventy three per year, round figures. Round figures. Um, and the the good thing about the equity adjustment, and I think we have. Um, the, the sheriff and his staff have been aware of this for a long time, but now it, it's kind of raised the, the understanding of what we need to do to keep this from happening in the future and what we need to do when we're hiring new staff. So this will lay a good foundation for you in the future so that hopefully you won't have to go back and do this. I wish I could tell you the same would be true for the market study, but the market study, the market is going to continue to move. And I, this is not directed at you personally, Wayne County um, uh, commissioners, because I tell this to all my clients across the state. The market, at least we've been blessed with a market that has been continuing to be robust and growing, but that just means it makes it harder for us to keep up. So. Uh, it doesn't need to be me. It doesn't need to be an outside consultant. It may be something Ginger and her staff can do. But you need to be keeping track and keeping up with the market. So about every two to three years, three to four years at the most, you need to come in and do a market study. And it may not be feasible to do all of Wayne County at one time. That's why we're kind of chipping away at it. Um, and some jurisdictions do it. They do a third, a third, and a third. So every three, you know, they have a sort of a three or four year cycle. And it's just easier from a budget standpoint to manage that. But it also lets employees know that, hey, I got looked at this year and three or four years from now, I'll get looked at again. You know, when it's been so long, employees just get real frustrated. And they say, when are they ever going to look at at mine, so I would I, I say that at the end of my presentations to all to, to most management and all elected officials too. This is something it will be less expensive if you keep up with it. But this is a big price tag, and I understand that because you all have a lot of priorities for your budget. And uh, but it it also is foundational to attracting and retaining high quality employees who provide the services that you want to provide in the community. But our issue, we build all the buildings we want to build, but we don't have staff to fill them. 
<laughs> exactly. But, but just to kind of comment on what Susan did, when I was in Alamance County, uh, it was 15 years before we did an overall pain class study for the county. And, and we kind of did what we, uh, we did here, look at bits and pieces in certain departments every now and then. But when we finally talked the board into saying, let's look at compression, let's look at overall market, uh, let's look at overall for the county, it was a $7 billion implementation. And there was absolutely no way that we were going to implement a $7 million uh, uh, increase for employees. Um, uh, we would have had to raise taxes four cents to do that. And you, you're, you know, it's not feasible to raise taxes just for employee benefits. So that program never got implemented. And the morale that it killed for the employees because they thought that they were, you know, being addressed, the, the board just basically said, we, we can't do it, it's too much, we're putting it to the side. But they, when you do it, we, we need to make sure we, we implement it because once they see the numbers on the paper and they see that the market inequitabilities are there, um, um, there's an expectation from our employees uh, that we do follow through. Well, I'm going to think that we were going to, uh, the HR department, Jenner and her staff could kind of look at all the de all the departments across the county and kind of bunch them up in thirds and kind of bunch them up in thirds where it would, you know, by your expertise, you say this is, this is a cost us about what we think may be about the same amount, you know, every so often, right. you know, so we're not killed with, like you say, a X amount well, of... Well, and, and I, I think, you know, Susan made a great point as well, where you, that will be easy to do once we, you, you take out the, the market compression within our employees. I, I, I think that way, by having that third party coming in and doing that, you know, we're not looking at that individually. We know the people. She's looking at it said you got X certification in X years, not knowing anybody from anybody right. and saying this is the way it is. But once that's done, then you can, it's much easier to look at the market. I'm talking about gender identifying the actual department. Right. So that way and, and we do, they're, they're, you know, we're looking at health and DSS, but there's a couple of the smaller ones that we want to look at as well for next budget year. And sometimes the market kind of drives what you're going to look at because yeah. right now, you know, just about every municipality in the state and lots of counties are looking at law enforcement yeah. positions because what's happening with hiring and retention for law enforcement. Yeah. So, I mean, you all had asked for this, but things have only gotten worse, gotten worse yeah. since the spring. Well, and, and market drove our EMS study right. because we were, were so down as far as um, uh, personnel. Market really did drive that as well. And the last point I wanted to make, and it reminded me, uh, we did a similar thing with, with the EMS study. They had already done the, the um, compression and, and um, equity analysis. I think they did, did more of that internally. Um, and I came in and did the market study, but we also implemented right. that, I think, first and then did, did the market study. So we're just recommending you follow a similar methodology for the sheriff's office that we did for EMS. And I think that study was well received. Yes, ma'am has been helpful, so happy to answer any other questions you have. Thank you for your time this morning and for the opportunity to work with your county. Thank you, Ms. Any questions? What, what we will need, and, and board correct me if I'm wrong, we will need a motion to allow the uh, market adjustments to be implemented January 1, and uh, then, or, or excuse me, the uh, uh, equity adjustments be December 1 and the market adjustments be uh, May January 1. Mr. Right. Chairman, mm -hmm. I so move. Do we, we're in work session. Are we still in session where we can vote now? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> I sure. wanted to make that motion. <laughs> 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 That's all I can I see is I was going to get a defibrillator. That's what I mean. <laughs> 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 What do, what do you know that we don't know? <laughs> sure, if you okay. Uh, I got one going. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be all right. I have, oh, I have a motion on the floor. Any discussion? It was a private joke. <laughs> <laughs> if, if no discussion, all in favor, show a sign of right hand. All opposed. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and all the commissioners. Please, well. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate your work. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> hey, ham for Christmas instead of sausage. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I expect that ham for Christmas. Remember? <laughs> Thanks for allowing me to make yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I saw, I, I heard, that, I heard that, 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 that sudden brush of air. I saw well, so I just know. <laughs> <laughs> so the equity be January 20th. Don't matter what it is. They'll be talking about that for two days. Uh, Mark is, or uh, January. Okay. So the session ends. We're going back to you. <coughs> Do I need a motion? It's to consider the performance of a uh, public officer and employees. Um, thank you, now. Wait a minute. I got to make sure we're off. Sir? Do I have a motion we adjourn? So move. All in favor, show sign of right hand. All opposed. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm.